Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. Let's pray, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this, your holy word. Thank you for this message. And thank you for these people who are here. Lord, we just want to please you. We want to be in your good and perfect will. Therefore, Lord, we pray that you would anoint us and fill us and lead us and guide us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we could see and hear what you would have for us this day. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Work together. Those are the key words here today of this sermon is work together. Romans 28 is sort of to me like an old rocking chair. And let me explain to that. When things seem to be going wrong, when things I don't understand, when things are going bad, afflictions and problems all around us, I just sort of climb into this, this, uh, this verse with prayer into the lap of God our Father, and I rock back and forth quoting this verse. Because this verse means something special to those who love God and are called according to His purposes. And it should be a promise that we as Christians should hold near and dear to us. So in times of trouble, I, I think of this psalm. That's the reason it's sort of like an old rocking chair. Sort of relaxes us, you know. And here the Spirit reminds us that God is using any and all things to make us like Jesus. Now the Bible certainly accepts the free agency of man. But interlacing with the free will of man is the overriding, overruling hand of God Almighty. He is sovereign. And those that love God and follow his purposes, we are assured that all things are working for our eternal good. Whatever happens, whatever befalls a Christian, uh, Everything contributes directly and indirectly in the promoting and securing of our eternal welfare. That's what this says. Everything will ultimately prove to be for our eternal benefit. Now, the precept of God's overruling sovereignty begins with a sort of a solemn affirmation here where it says... And we know. Notice what he says. And we know. Now this expresses the knowledge of faith and practice. If you don't have faith, you don't know, do you? So you have to have faith. And when you have faith, then you can say, and we know. It expresses faith. Well, how do we know? Think about this for a second. How do we know? Well, we know of God's overruling sovereignty because of the Scriptures. The Scriptures tells us plainly that He overrules and He's in charge and He's sovereign. Also, we know about the testimony of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our hearts, in us. The, the Holy Spirit testifies to the sovereignty of God. And we also know about the testimony of prayer when we're praying and God speaks to our hearts in our lives. We also know about the testimony of the faithful and other Christians. And we know even by things that have happened to us in our past life, don't we? In the rest of the past of our life, the, the things over years, we see God's work. We know that God's overruling sovereignty is working in our lives. A Sunday school teacher was telling the story of Abraham and his obedience to God and where he was about to sacrifice Isaac on the mountain. And as the story got real close to where he's picking up the dagger and he's about to stab the Isaac and killing him, a little girl ple pleaded, begged, said, Oh, please stop, stop, don't tell anymore, I don't go on. And this story is too terrible. And then another little girl in the class says, Don't. Be silly, Mary. This is one of God's stories, and all of God's stories always come out good. <laughs> well, that's because, think about it, God always works everything together for the good. God rules and overrules, and he causes everything to come out right for his children 
who love him. And the Christian life bears witness to God's watch and his care. Those that are loving God and following his purposeful, uh, his calling, know that all things do work together for the good. Now one doesn't have to be very old really to look back and see that things that we thought maybe were disasters in our lives, they actually worked out for good. You ever look back on your life and you saw something that happened, you said, oh, this is terrible. At the time, you, you could see no good of it. But then later on in time, we notice that God used that to make this happen or that happen. That's the way God does. We don't have to be too old to look back and see how God actually takes things in our lives and makes it good. Things that we thought maybe were disappointments, they worked out actually to become great blessings. So, let's look at this for a minute. God works for the good. The general contextual uh, background for things here uh, in Paul's writings have been sufferings and weakness. And we've learned that the difficulties and trials of life are really, uh, why did Paul put it? They're insignificant compared to the glory of God that would be revealed in us. Remember me preaching about that? How we have troubles, we have weaknesses, but they will be nothing when we are in the glory of God. Now these trials, though, call forth the exercising of something, exercising of our hope, our hope in Jesus. And they give us an occasion for actually a loving intercession by the Holy Spirit. When we go through trials and tribulations, the Holy Spirit's with us. And this is occasions for us to learn and draw nearer to the Holy Spirit. I know we don't like trials and we don't like suffering, but in reality, a lot of the suffering and trials draw us closer to God. The afflictions of this life are not inconsistent with our being children of God. Some people say, well, if you're a child of God, you don't have troubles. Well, we all children of God. We know that's not true, don't we? It's not true. These afflictions can really be real blessings. For God is working ceaselessly, uh, ceaselessly continuing always to work. He's energetic, and he has a purpose on our behalf. And the preposition here in the object for the good is a Greek word, it's isis, E-I-S. It means the result of good or ultimately good. Not all things are good or for our good. But God, given the opportunity, can work all things for our ultimate eternal good. That's why people get the wrong ideas. When they read this, they read it wrong. It says, doesn't it say everything's good? That's not what it says. It says God works all things together. So we have things that happens to us that's not good. Not all things are good. But God has the opportunity, he can work them together for our good. Now God's working for God does not, uh, working for good does not mean that all things that happen to us is good. In fact, evil is present in our lives because we are sinners and we live in a fallen sinful world. But God is able to take every circumstance and around and turn it around and for our long range, for eternity, make it good. Our sovereign God can work all things, even the evil, even the negative and bad that occur. To, he can make it and change it and work it together to make it a positive purpose, to make it good for his eternal plan. And that's for us. Nothing is beyond the overruling, the overriding scope of God's providence. God is God. And he can do it. God does not say that each individual thing that happens to us is good, but that God works them together for our good. God takes all the undesirable stresses. We have stresses in our lives, don't we? We have problems in our lives. 
God takes them all and mixes them up together and he puts them under the heat of crisis and somehow God, I don't know how he does it because I'm not God, but somehow he takes all that stuff and makes it work together for our good. Now again, the emphasis is this. He working things together for good. They not only work or operate, but bad things actually cooperate together. It's the wise connection of one thing with another that gains the desired result. There are many things in the case of a maybe a saint. If you take them by themselves, <clears throat> they prove to be nothing but good, or I mean nothing but evil. Think about this for a second. An example would be Joseph's brothers and how they treated Joseph. By itself, if he'd just taken um, one evil and they threw him in the well, remember? That was one evil. If they just left that one evil, it might not have worked out, right? But there was another evil they took. They sold him to the Midians of slavery, didn't they? So here's another evil thing. So one evil would have been bad, but two evils, God used those two evils to make good. See, so it took two evils to make a good thing. It worked together. One thing by itself, if it had just been in the pit, he'd been in the pit. Or if they just sold him as a slave, it might have just been sold as a slave. But working together, Joseph became a lord in the land of Egypt. When things look bad, we have to remember that God is good. We need to look beyond our circumstances, our immediate circumstances, and trust God that in his time, he will bring a good purpose in our lives. But I know it's difficult because we're the ones in the middle. Do you think Joseph was feeling pretty good when he was in the bottom of the well? He probably wasn't, was he? Do you think he felt pretty happy when he was sold as a slave? No, I'm sure he wasn't. Was he think he's happy when he was put in prison because of the false accusations of the wife of Potiphar? Sure, no, he wasn't. But you see, all that together in time, God worked it all for good. You know, I, I think we can be very thankful that we serve a God who is sovereign and loving and all-wise and all-powerful. Nothing frustrates him. We get frustrated when something bad happens and we want to give up. I do sometimes, don't you? I get frustrated. I know I can't do anything and uh, get aggravated and frustrated. But you see, God doesn't do that. He's not frustrated. Nothing frustrates him. He knows exactly what he's doing because he is God. He's, he's always that way. And, and because of that, he can always, he always is doing things. Nothing can stop him. Nothing escapes his attention. We can take all things both good and bad, and work them together, and he does it for the benefit of his children. Now, he will use all that happens to those who love him and follow his purpose to transform them into the image of his son. And this truth not only gives us great confidence and joy and peace, but you know what? I think it gives us a good reason to give thanks in everything, no matter what it is. We really have a good reason to give thanks for everything, even the things that we call bad. Because God will make them good. I uh, sort of talked about this years ago. I remember <laughs> a young person Talk about how it seems like bad things. I was preaching, talking to him, a Bible study about how bad things come uh, in not just one bad thing, but usually two or three bad things come together. And I was telling him how God works that together. And 
one of my young people says, oh, no, that's not good. I says, what's the matter? Well, if one bad thing just happens, that means I got two more bad things I got to live with that's going to happen. I said, that's not always the case, but maybe you don't know. Then it's working for who? Working for who? Now note that the first two conditions are prerequisites. For God will work all things together for their good. First, it's for those that love God. The first qualifier here, who has God working all things together for good, is those who really love God. Many people say they love God, but do they really love God? That's the question. I don't know people's hearts like God Almighty does. He doesn't make a mistake. He knows our hearts. Many people say they love God, but their actions don't show it. The things they do don't show it. Just the words out of their mouth says they love God. So we need to understand something. If we want this promise, if we truly want God to take all the bad that happens to us and turn them into good, we must make sure that in our hearts we love God. The Bible says that all things work together for good, but only to them that love God. Loving God is the necessary condition for the promise of God to work all things for our good. The first and great commandment is that we love God with all our being. Remember, that's what Jesus said and that's what's in the commandments. We should love God with all our heart and strength and mind. Our love is undoubtedly the product of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, though, for us, because we can't love God enough by ourselves. Romans 8, 28 does not say that all things work together for good for all people. It doesn't say for all people. Many people today live in open rebellion against God. Other people, they have a complete, total indifference to God and his claims upon them. And our sin does not work the righteousness of God. Some people say, well, I'll sin and make bad things happen, and then God will work that together for the good. Well, see, their heart is wrong already. They can't claim that promise because they don't love God. This chapter's been talking about those who are living in the Spirit. That's what Paul's been talking about prior to this. He's talking about those who are living in the Spirit versus those who are living in the what? The flesh. Though you have the ones who live in the Spirit and those who live in the flesh. The only way we can be obedient to God is in the Spirit. Those who love God are those who are filled with His Spirit so that we may keep His Word and do His will. Doesn't mean we're perfect. We still slip, we still sin, but we're quick to call on God and ask for forgiveness and repent. The meaning is that only those who love God have the right to be comforted by this promise, to be honest with you. The verse concludes with the last prerequisite. It says, who have been called according to his purpose. Now this is a little bit harder to understand, a little bit harder for people to grasp. But this is the second qualification to God's gracious promise and proposal here. Whose purposes or plans for life are those who love God following? Obviously, it's God's purposes, right? It's not our purposes. It's God's purposes. Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans, right? Israel was called out of Egypt and called into the enjoyment of uh, privileges. We are called out of darkness into light. We are called out of slavery into freedom. By, By divine intervention, we are accepted under divine influence and we are brought into the position of high privileges and high hopes. But that is by the grace of God. Christians have accepted and we have heeded the call to live life according to God's purpose. 
Again, doesn't mean we're perfect. We don't do perfect job of it all the time. That's why there's a continual need for us to repent and ask for forgiveness. Christians are those who, who accept the privileges and responsibilities in which we are called. We are called to a life of service that glorifies God and pleases God. Now, you hear me, I sort of separate the glorifying God and pleasing God. Sometimes you can actually separate those two. Because sometimes what we're doing may not glorify God, but it may please God because we're doing something that he wants us to do that may not give him glory until later. In other words, we won't see the glory of God. But we have listened to God and we are heeding his direction and we're trying our best to follow his will. That's what's important. This call is not according to our merits, but according to the purpose of God. God has a divine purpose for everyone. We are all called. There is a purpose for us all. By our free will, though, your free will and my free will, by our free will, we must answer the call and follow God's purpose for our individual lives. That's why we look at each other and we see differences. We see differences. We, we're not the same. We're not at the same level. But God's called all of us but it's by our free will and our faith, the level of faith, as to how close we're following God's purposes in our lives. Do y'all understand that? That's the reason some people have more faith than others. And those who have a lot of faith need to be more patient with those who have little faith. Don't make fun of them. Don't be upset with them. They have their faith. You can teach them, you can train them, but it's God, it's His Spirit that's what's going to give them more faith. Not, not us. If that would work, I would, y'all would have so much faith because I'd be driving faith in you guys every day. But I can't do it. All I can do is give you God's Word and the message and what I see and what God has revealed to me. I try to reveal it to you. And it's your faith at that point that takes over. Does that make sense? So it's not our merits that give us this promise, though. It's God's purpose in our lives. Have you accepted the call into God's purposes? That's the question. What are you, what are you going? Where are you going? What are you doing? Your purpose or God's purpose? Which way are you going? The promised blessings here are for those who will follow God's plan as recorded in His Word. We love God. We follow His purposes. Hallelujah. So in conclusion, we do not, I repeat, we do not always know what God is doing. And sometimes we don't even welcome what God is doing in our lives, do we? Now, let's be honest, because sometimes it just seems like things are not going the way we think they should go. It doesn't matter. Well, maybe if we knew it was from God, but most of the times when it's something like that, we say, well, that's not from God, whether it's from God or not, right? <laughs> if we don't like it, the first thing out of our mind, our thought, mouth is, well, that's not from God because I don't like that. Because we always like what comes from God, right? Well, that's not true. Some things we don't accept as being from God because we don't like them. But it doesn't matter. We don't understand. We don't understand. But yet we know that sometimes we have to accept it because it is from God. And we're not told that God is working for our comfort. When I read this scripture, I'm thinking... I should feel really good about it, and I do. But it's not comfort that God is promising me. Do you see comfort there? 
I don't see any comfort. It's good that he's working together things that make good. I may not see the good until the working together has finished. And I may have to suffer some more or something different that God can work together for the good. He's not promising me the proverbial rose garden. That's not what he's promising me. And he's not promising you comfort or a rose garden. But we do know this, that God is working all things for our final and supreme good. Hallelujah. That is a, our hope. Because those who are in Christ, who love God and following his purpose for their lives, should rest in perfect confidence beneath the shadow of the wings of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What else can we do anyway? Rebel against God? What else can we do? Blame God? What else can we do? Yell at God? Yes, maybe some of us do yell at God sometimes. I do. Probably you do. God's got big shoulders. He can handle it. But in reality, the only thing I can do is accept God and follow him. Because I love him. And that's all you can do. All things work for the good because all things are under the control of God. And we have been called to his purpose. That is our hope, our final joy. All things work for the good, for those who love God, and for those who follow his purpose. Let's pray.